I am not a historian, but neither are you. So, how about we the people learn this stuff together? Welcome to US 101. Okay, go ahead and ring the bell. I know you're going to do it. You're not ringing the bell? Oh, you're not ringing the bell today. All right, sweet. All right, we can just jump into the ep <laughs> You slick mother... <laughs> Gerrymandering. Nope, it's not a fancy way people used to say that they were going to become intimate with themselves back in the 19th century. It's actually a way for political parties to establish strategic district boundaries in order to gain an advantage in an election. And recently, in the state of Wisconsin, it was deemed unconstitutional. A panel of three federal judges ruled that the Wisconsin legislature's 2011 redrawing of state assembly districts to favor Republicans violated the First Amendment as well as the Equal Protection Clause in the 14th Amendment. Their reason was that it deprived Democratic voters their right to be represented. Now, in case you're not familiar or just unaware, district lines are redrawn every 10 years based on the results of the census so that each district will contain roughly the same amount of people. But both Republicans and Democrats have been known to redraw those district lines to favor themselves in elections. So how long has gerrymandering even been a thing? Furthermore, how has it managed to shape the nation and where did it even get that name from? Here's how it happened. Turns out that this tactic was actually being employed all the way back in 1788 with the help of Patrick Give Me Liberty or Give Me Death Henry. Henry and his crew of anti-federalists really didn't want James Madison to be in the House of Representatives. So in order to try to keep him out, they redrew the lines of the 5th Congressional District in the state of Virginia, but they were unsuccessful. James Madison still made it in. But this tactic wasn't called gerrymandering until 1812, and it was inspired by the Massachusetts governor at the time, Eldridge Gerry, who, by the way, was also one of the signers of the Declaration. He signed a bill allowing the district lines around the state of Massachusetts to be redrawn in order to favor his party, which was the Democratic Republican Party. And one of the lines around the Boston area specifically, as you can see, looked a little looked a little wonky. In fact, some people said that it looked kind of like a salamander. So the oh-so-witty folks at the Boston Gazette decided to draw up a little cartoon and call it a gerrymander, combining the word salamander and the governor's last name. Although this cartoon's kind of got me wondering if the people in Boston in the 19th century even knew what a salamander looked like, because this one's got like wings and talons and fangs. Here's what an actual salamander looks like, by the way. Yeah, people in Boston, I'm pretty sure, had never even seen a salamander in real life. Now, one of the biggest gerrymanders of all time actually had to do with the state of Dakota. You're not familiar with the state of Dakota? Oh, okay, see, you know them as North and South Dakota, but that was not supposed to be the case. In 1889, President Grover Cleveland was set to make states of the territories now known as Montana, Dakota, New Mexico, and Washington. But later that year, Republicans went on to win the House and the Senate. And because of that, they only wanted to admit states that would vote for their party, that would vote for the GOP. So they took this giant landmass that was supposed to be the state of Dakota, drew a line right in half, and now you get North and South Dakota. Two states instead of one, and because each state admitted into the union automatically gets three votes in the Electoral College, right there is six votes headed straight for the Republican Party come election season. And since then, there have been some weird, weird uses of gerrymandering, man. I mean, look at North Carolina right here, for example, okay? I'll bring it a little bit closer. Districts 4, 9, and 12. Those districts look like someone finished mapping the state, stepped back, looked at the map, went, oh shit, I forgot some, and then just kind of squeezed them in there in the hopes that no one would notice. Now, in addition to using it to create states out of thin air and also to create some odd state art, I guess, gerrymandering also has a negative connotation attached to it. Prior to the Voting Rights Act of 1965, Southern white Democrats primarily controlled redistricting in Southern states, which would reduce the impact African Americans had when it came to elections. Now, following the passing of that act, some states created what are known as majority minority districts, which predominantly have constituencies that are non-white. And this was done primarily to promote the voting of minority candidates. And this became to be known as as affirmative gerrymandering. Furthermore, the bill stipulates that states that historically used redistricting to systematically put minority voters at a disadvantage had to get the Department of Justice's approval before any redistricting could be done. 10 points to anybody that can figure out which states on the map had to go through that process. I'll give you a hint. The Deep South. 
Now, many people have asked, how is gerrymandering even a thing? How is that allowed to happen? Okay, why doesn't the Supreme Court step in and do something about it? They actually have been put on the spot quite a few times to determine whether gerrymandering was in fact unconstitutional. In 1993, in the case of Shaw versus Reno, the Supreme Court ruled that North Carolina state legislature was unconstitutional in the redrawing of its 12th district because race was the primary reason for the redrawing. But then in 1999, in the case of Hunt versus Cromartie, the court ruled that North Carolina's legislature wasn't unconstitutional in redrawing its 12th district because they claimed that it was partisan gerrymandering, which is tolerable and not racially motivated. Edward Foley, the director of the Election Law Project at Ohio State University, recently summed up the Supreme Court's views on gerrymandering when he said this, quote, nobody has come up with a standard to measure constitutionality, how to distinguish between malevolent, evil partisanship that's manipulative versus the natural advantage one party might have as a result of where voters happen to live." End quote. And here's one of the real crazy things about gerrymandering, as if this wasn't crazy enough. The United States is the only major country that allows its politicians in the state legislature to draw those district lines. Unlike Canada, which uses independent, nonpartisan commissions to draw the lines. And here I thought Canada was just America's odd-shaped hat. Well done, Canucks. Well done indeed. So now that you've gotten just a little bit of a background on gerrymandering, how it's been used to, in some cases, shape the country and shape the state of elections in the United States, what do you think of it? Let's discuss and debate in the comment section, man. Do you think gerrymandering should continue to be a thing? Should district lines be done by nonpartisan groups instead of politicians? Are you cool with the system the way it is now? Let me know. And that's it for this episode of US 101, guys. Thank you so much for watching. And for those of you that have been liking the videos, sharing them, and subscribing them, I sincerely appreciate it, guys. Thank you so much for helping to build this channel and to help it grow. And uh, I will see you next Tuesday for an all-new episode of US 101. Until then, as per usual, we are all done. All done. I'm going to walk this way now because that's normally the direction I go. Here we go. Off we go.